I'm Gilbert Gottfried. This is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast. <laughs> I'm, and here. I'm deaf. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here with my co-host Frank Santo Padre, and uh, <laughs> once again, and he's turned off my earphones. No, no, no. Did, no. I, turn, did I turn your earphones uh, you off? You turned off my earphones. <laughs> Yes. Now, now I can hear myself. Okay, great. And where was I? Oh, yes. <laughs> this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast until Frank <laughs> fucked up the earphones. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, oh, it's Frank Sando Padre yeah. who fucked yeah, up that, the earphones. Yeah, that'd be me. And uh, we're once again recording it at Nutmeg with our engineer, Frank Verderosa, who lost three of our shows. Oh, cut that <laughs> okay. out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Our guest this week is a singer, musician, songwriter, and recording artist, and one of the most popular performers to emerge from the pop music period known as the British Invasion. At the tender age of 19, he was signed by legendary manager Brian Epstein and was soon playing to sold-out houses and throngs of screaming teenage girls as the lead singer of Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas. Along his six-decade journey, he's recorded hit records such as Bad to Me, Little Children, and From a Window, appeared on popular shows like Shindig, Hullabaloo, The Ed Sullivan Show, The Tammy Show, and worked with George Martin, The Bee Gees, The Rolling Stones, Badfinger, Gene Pitney, The Hollies, Jerry Lee Lewis, Dusty Springfield, <laughs> The Kinks, The Ronettes, and oh yes, four guys named John, Paul, George, and Ringo. His recent CD of original songs is called I Won the Fight, and we're thrilled to welcome to the show a true rock and roll survivor and the first person to release a Lennon and McCartney song even before the Beatles themselves, Billy J. Kramer. Thank you. Wow. Well, there's no time for anything else. So you can go home. <laughs> I can't believe you've done all that, no, can you, no, Bill? No, I can't believe it. No. <laughs> <laughs> there's more. <laughs> there's more. There's just some we more. Could, we could do a seven minute intro yeah. if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is more. <laughs> yeah. That was one of our shorter ones. <laughs> it was one of the shorter ones. I never ones. realized it myself, you know. You are the first liver Liverpudlian that I believe I've ever met really? in the flesh. Oh. Yeah. Well, we're pretty normal. You know. <laughs> pretty normal. Yeah. And, and I was reading your book. The book, by the way, is called Do You Want to Know a Secret, which we should have put in the intro. That's my fault. But we'll plug it all through the See, show. He fucked up I fucked that up, too. Yeah. But, um, and this is interesting, and to share with Gilbert, you, when you were very young, you, you, were, you were in bomb shelters. Yeah. Um, during, during blitzes. Yeah, I was uh, born in World War, World War Two. Yeah, um, we had a air shelter in the backyard, uh, which we used to go down. I was only a baby, but I, my father tells me how they would take us down there at night when the, the bombers came over. Yeah, it's yeah. A, that's amazing to me. It was one of those things like they always show in the movies, at least, where the sirens start going off. Apparently so, but you know, I was I was a baby, you know. Yeah, but still, it's a, it's, it's, it's a terrifying uh, thing for your family. Well, uh, terrifying when you look back at it, you know, it's, it is scary. It is scary. And uh, what is Boodle? Boodle is just a part of Liverpool? Boodle is it a neighborhood? Is a, uh, Boodle is a suburb of uh, Liverpool. It's a suburb. And the amazing thing is I've, I've, I found out recently that the, the, the Beatle, you know, logos, the, the font is Boodle. That's what it's called. Really? The yeah. name of the font, the yes. famous Beatle font. That's yes. cool trivia. Oh, yeah. That's cool trivia. Yeah. And how how old were you when you first started getting interested in music? Uh, as a kid at school. Yeah. You were in a choir. I was in the school choir. Uh, that was, a, you know, it was one of those things, the choir master was a man called uh, Mr. Burke. And one day he had us all singing and he just walked around the class, I'll take you, I'll take you. <laughs> And he grabbed me, <laughs> and uh, that's how I got in the choir. And who were you? What were your favorite type movies when you were going to movies? And your favorite actors? You know, I wasn't really into movies, so you don't get into that until you get a bit older. Mostly cartoons, you know, Popeye, and, 
you know, stuff like <laughs> but you saw Tom and Jerry. You saw Rock yes. Around the Clock, and that was influential. It, it, well, I just saw Rock Around the Clock, you know, because uh, that was when rock and roll was first coming in in, in Great Britain. And um, I remember it was like the Teddy Boy era. Mm-hmm. Where, and I remember them, like, ripping the cinema seats up and throwing them at the screen. What's, and, a, what's a Teddy Boy? Uh, I, well, um, a Teddy Boy is a guy with grease back hair, long drape, uh, jackets, Velvet uh, collars, oh. drain pipe trousers, and then beetle crusher shoes. Wow. And yeah. they would tear the, cha- the the seats out and throw them at the screen. That's, that's, that's what happened. Wow. And uh, that was... Uh, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and I heard John Lennon say he wanted to come across as a teddy boy all the time, but in real life, he was he'd be scared of them. I think so. You know... Um, I think he had a, a sort of Teddy Boy thing about him. You know, I remember sort of uh, um, when they did a Magical Mystery Tour and they, were, they had a big party at a hotel in London and, you know, we were all instructed to turn up in fancy dress and he just turned up in a denim jacket with John uh, in studs on the back with his hair greased back. That was his fancy dress, mm-hmm. which I thought was uh, cool, you know. So you're in a choir. The, the teacher's plucking you guys out of uh, hand-selecting people for this yes. choir. And when does wh- – you, you bought yourself a guitar at a certain point. You taught yourself the guitar. Yeah. When when did the, the, the rock and roll thing sort of start as, a, as an idea? Um, you know, it, I used to – I think in, in Britain then there was very little sort of rock and roll on the radio. Mm-hmm. It was like uh, Radio Luxembourg was on a Sunday Sunday night, and I used to listen to – to uh, Radio Luxembourg, and they played people like Buddy Holly and Chuck Berry and Little Richard and, you know, the rock and rollers. And uh, that's where I first started getting it, you know. And what was happening in Liverpool around uh, this time? Um, funny enough, um, Skiffle. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I don't know why, but I, Skiffle, to me, I, I always had the feeling it wasn't going to be around long. It was, I just, one of those instincts I had as a kid, you know, I mean, I remember... Uh, Gavin, a tea chest with a broom handle and string. A tea chest? Uh, yeah. yeah. And acoustic guitars and uh, washboards and singing. You know, when you look into it, though, Skiffle is American. That's the funny thing about it. It's American traditional music. When you, when, when I checked it out. That's interesting. When we hear Skiffle, we think of Lonnie Donegan and uh, does your does your bubble gum, oh, your yes, chewing gum yes. lose its flavor <laughs> on the bedpost overnight? And my old man's a dust man. And, right. But his big, his big, uh, the big record for him that made him was um, Rock Island Line. Okay. I'm not going to sing it. But That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to sing it. Um, um, that was it, you know. So you start, at some point you started a Skiffle group. Yeah. Friends of mine, everybody did, you know, it's just a cheap thing to do you know um there wasn't a lot of money around at that time yeah and um then i you know i got into uh i taught myself the guitar i was mm-hmm. self-taught mm-hmm. and um i used to just play with the kids from the neighborhood well, what kind of stuff did you play um a lot of like everly brothers songs oh oh american you know, music american music buddy holly and mm-hmm. all of it you know but you were shy. You didn't. You. you I, I, I still am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you, it's interesting for a performer, and you make a point in the book of saying that you were content to stand in the back and just play, and you never dreamed of becoming front and center, become becoming the lead singer. I'm glad I did. I did so. <laughs> You're glad you did. I'm, no, I'm glad you did. Sometimes I don't know, you know. But um, I, I, you know, I'll be honest with you. The, the band auditioned quite a few different singers. And uh, you mean the Dakotas? No, I, I was with a band called the Coasters. Oh, the Coasters, right? Uh, Were you the Phantoms first? Yes. Yeah. And and they auditioned different singers who didn't last long. And then one day they said, "You know, Billy, your guitar playing is not progressing very well. So I think you should have a try at singing." And um, I remember singing at this like uh, what do you call them here? These uh, halls where. Legion Hall. Yeah, Legion Hall, I sure. S- I sang at this Legion Hall, and uh, the guitar I had, I thought this will... I, I uh, put the guitar on the stage and thought this will be a, a passing phase, and it got stolen that night, and I couldn't afford another, so um, that was me. That's how I ended up singing. Uh-huh. 
That's right. When did you when did you first see the Beatles? I I know the answer to this. December nineteen sixty. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you see them? The Little in Town Hall. And you knew something. You knew you knew there was something different about them immediately. I knew it. Yeah. I, you know. I. It was one of them places where people used to go on a Thursday night and sort of like stand around, hang out around the perimeter of this ballroom, and. Um, I I was just hanging out, and the curtains opened, and Paul McCartney was singing "Long Tall Sally," and everybody just ran to the front. I'd never seen that before, and I just went, "Wow!" You who know, are these guys? Who are these guys? And I remember I said to my friends, "They're going to be they're going to be bigger than Elvis," and they went, "You've been drinking too much," <laughs> <laughs> and I no, but I I sincerely meant it. I always felt that they were going to be really big. And five Beatles at this point, right? It's Stu Sutcliffe and Pete Best. Yes. Yeah. 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 And with Pete Best, there's one of those stories. I know. Yeah. It's one of those stories that, you know, nobody's ever given a real answer. You know, it's it was to me, it was always strange that suddenly, like, the Beatles are going to make records and everything, and then Pete gets dropped and, you know... Well, there's a point in the book I found interesting where you just talked about it. Maybe it wasn't that show, but it was another show where you saw the the, immediately upon the conclusion of the show, the girls made a beeline for Pete. Well, you know, Bob Willer, who was a local DJ, Mm -hmm. after every show, he'd say, let's hear it one more time for John, George, Paul and Pete. And when Pete Best used to walk on the stage, the girls would just jump up and go crazy. So the prevailing theory is what? I mean, that, I mean that, why, why would you want to get rid of someone like that? Right. But the, the theory, the, thing, the most popular theory, I suppose, Gil, yeah, what is what? It's that, like there, he's getting old. No, I think, I think what the, the, the one I heard was uh, Ringo was a better Beatle, you know, um, than what Pete was. Just more of a team player? Uh, he, he fitted in. So, you know, I, you know, I, I mean, I'll get into it if you want to. Yeah, we'd like <laughs> yeah. to hear it. You know, I mean, uh, it, it. You know, as somebody, my knowledge of business and what goes on in show business, as we all know, it's a, a terrible business, and it's. <laughs> we, can all, we can all. I think we can all attest to that. And, and it can be very unkind at times. You know, um, it must. I mean, how must he have felt? You know. Yeah. But uh, must I mean. You know, he'd been through all the, the Hamburg and the gigs. And sure, then, of course. And then suddenly you get dropped, and, you know, I, it's a bit, that's rock and roll, that's show business. And now, all. you were talking to us before the mics went on because that's when we do our best part of the show. <laughs> uh, but you you spoke to Pete Best recently. I see him from time to time, uh-huh. and he, he's uh, very unassuming. He's a very nice man. I like Pete very much, you know. And he's still in Liverpool. He's still in Liverpool, yes. Now, does he carry... I mean, it's like, you know, when you think about him, he's one of those stories where you go, oh, my God, you know, the Beatles became bigger than God. God, yeah. Um, From my, you know, the times, I've never seen him show any signs of resentment, you know. Be very hard not to, but, I mean... You know, he just comes across as a very humble, nice person. Mm-hmm. But it must have been tough at times, I'm sure. I'm trying to get the chronology of this. So you were you were with the uh, the Phantoms, then the Coasters, yes. And when do you change your name from Bill Ashton to? When I was with the Coasters. Uh huh. And and why? Because they they the guys in the band thought I needed a stage name. I thought my own name, which is William Howard Ashton was a good name, but it wasn't rock and roll enough. I, looking <laughs> looking <It's> back. Interesting. <laughs> you know, and uh, they got this big list of phone numbers, and I said, do what you want. As long as it's, it's got to be Billy. You wanted to obviously keep your first name. I had yeah. to keep that. And um, they got on to, to a, a telephone up for you. said, which, which name do you like the best? And she said, Billy Kramer. And they said, okay, that'll do. Now, most people assume that J in your name means Jew. <laughs> but is that is that correct? The J came from, um, I'd made my first record 
with George Martin, and it was going to be released a few few weeks later. And Brian called me in the office, and, and John Lennon was there, and he said, John has a suggestion. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, why don't you call yourself Billy J. Graham? Um, it'll catch on a lot better than just Billy Graham. And I said, thank you so much. I think he was right. I think he was dead right. <laughs> well, he wasn't wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're Bill- So it's now it's Billy J. Kramer and the Coasters? No, the Dakotas. I'd left. Oh, you'd left by this time. Because by, by this time what had happened... Billy was, Kramer and the Coasters. Billy Kramer and the Coasters, yes. Okay, now I'm getting it. And then I, what happened was I, I worked for British Rail, and I was about to leave... Get out of rock and roll altogether. You worked on locomotives. Yeah, I was yeah. going to go to crew mm-hmm. and work, do a, a course with Rolls Royce for a year, and that was about it. I was going to pack it all in, and then Brian Epstein came along and made me an offer. And I'd always thought, you know, I'd seen, I'd seen other people, uh, but to me, I always thought if anybody was going to open doors and do it, it was going to be Brian. You know, I wouldn't have done, you know, I wouldn't have been turned professional for, for anybody else. I'd have carried on in engineering. So you're 19. Yeah. And he where, and where did he see you that he decided that he had to manage you? Um, He saw me, I used to do open shows for the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And then there was a popularity poll in a local paper, Mersey Beat. And um, it was for the top 20 bands. There was about 500 bands around Liverpool. And I came second. But it was joint second with a guy called Lee Curtis on the All Stars. And uh, they had this presentation at a place called the Majestic Ballroom, Birkenhead, the other side of the water from Liverpool. And um, we all had to get up and do a few songs. And, you know, that's where he saw me performing. And 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 you decided that you want you had a by the time he signed you you had an idea of how you wanted to look you wanted the no I, funny enough because I was like you didn't no because I, I was um, flamboyant you know I used to wear like gold army jackets and right. pink and stuff like that you know and because I thought that's what young kids wanted and what happened was like the, the guys in in my first band the, the coasters they had other professions and they didn't want to turn professional. And Brian put me with an established band from Manchester, the Dakotas. The Dakotas. And they said to Brian, we're not going to, you know, we won't do it if he's going to be like the way he is. He's got to like... <laughs> you were a little glam? Was yeah. that it? <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, I, I didn't know that at the time. You know, I found out later. But that was, that was part of the deal. He's going to have to dress down. And... That was one of the first things he said to me. Um, we're going to throw away the Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. So you got rid of the gold suit and the gold shoes. Yeah, all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny to me that Liverpool in America mm-hmm. only means the Beatles. You know, it's like no one else lives in Liverpool. <laughs> Like, well, there's no life other than... Well, it's completely associated with <laughs> yeah. them, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the thing is, you know, what people don't realize is that they've always had great soccer teams. Um, you know, the rock stars like Billy Fury was a big rock star that nobody knows here. Michael Holiday was a singer in the 50s who, who had number one hits. I'm ashamed to say I don't know those names. In Liverpool was known for comedians like... Uh, Ted Ted Ray, Arthur Askey, all these sort of people. You, know, you should check it out. Do you know these names, Gilbert? No. Ted Ray? No. Yeah, that, that was known for, you know. My father used to take me to the Shakespeare Theatre when I was a kid, and they'd have this, like, blackboard and easel, and they'd, 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 as the different acts would come, come on and off. <laughs> you know. Uh, that's, you know. What was the Cavern Club like? I mean, uh, you, as you hear about legendary places. Yeah, it stunk. Yeah, you know, yeah. There was there was sewage. It, it wasn't sewage. Oh. No, I, I don't know what it was. But <laughs> <laughs> it was, they put so much disinfectant down. You, you know, um, it wasn't a, the greatest of places, but it, it was a great place to play. You know, the atmosphere at the cavern. And, and I always tell people, you know, that if you didn't see the Beatles at the cavern, you, 
you never saw them. Wow. Because that, that was before the suits, and that's when they were really rock and roll. Right. Hey, this is it. The Beatles sing some other song. So let's get the order of this. Now you're now you're a client of Brian's. Yes. And are you are you still opening for them for the Beatles? Are you doing are you you, 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 um, you doing your own gigs? I, I was always doing my own gigs as well as that. That was just a mm-hmm. occasional thing. You know, I would do when they were sort of branching out, getting out of Liverpool. I would you know open for them. And they were a cover band. That's what I find so fascinating. At the yeah, very beginning. Yes, they were a cover band. But the thing is with the Beatles. Um, they were very clever about the covers they did. You know, most of the bands around, they all had the same repertoire, but the Beatles, uh, you know, were playing songs that nobody else was playing. So people thought that they were original. You know, I mean, none of us had a clue of how great the songwriters they were. You know, They were I, doing Money and A Taste of Honey uh, and you know, Boys uh, and Chains. Sure. And, yeah. And and there's a, one of the most fascinating things in the book is is them telling you that they're going to start doing some original compositions. Yes, and your reaction to it. I, I that was at uh, um, a, a place in Witness, and funny enough, there was a band called uh, the Tornadoes. I just gone to number one with Tel- oh, Telstar. Yeah, and um, you know that one, Gil. Oh yeah, and Telstar. Oh, was that da 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 and I said, why don't we get some, like, Goffin and King or somebody to write some good songs? Because, you, know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and because nobody knew, you know. Right. Yet, when you heard Please Please Me. I, when I heard Please Please Me, I, I knew it was going to be number one. When I heard Love Me Do, I thought, you know, that was a shock to me because I was like, I'd hear the Beatles doing, like, Slow Down, and money and, and McCartney singing along to old Sally. And I was in the van with the Dakotas one day, you know, traveling along, and I heard Love Me Too, and I thought, that's not them. You know, it's like something the Everly Brothers would do. It, you know? Yeah. And um, I was a bit disappointed. But then I heard Please Please Me. And you said that's a hit. Oh, yeah. Interesting that you had the, the, the ear for that, and you knew. Oh, yeah. I I always wonder, and I I've always I've asked a few people is, where do you think the Beatles would have wound up without George Martin? I think they'd have been successful. I think it was inevitable. I think with the the songwriting ability and the talent, um, they they were somehow got the. It was just made. To, it was, you know, it was it, it was in the stars. In the stars. That's yeah. interesting. So now, when Brian puts you with the Dakotas, right? There's a there's a there's a kink because you guys don't seem to get on very well. Well, Liverpool people and Manchester people don't really. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a fact? Well, you know, it's, 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 there's the rivalry about soccer. <laughs> okay, it seems stupid, but you know there is. <laughs> 
it does. I mean, I think anybody, anybody being a bit funny about, you know, soccer and sports is a bit ridiculous. But we were, we were all young. And plus, I mean, they were just different kinds of people than, than I was. Yeah. I was, I mean, I'm, I'm still very down to earth. You know, I've always tried to be that way and that's it. They were a different type of people than, than me. So at one point, your, your band wasn't even speaking to you. Yeah, um, it was weird because, I mean, I went to Hamburg and um, they went their way and I went my way. And uh, it, was, it was very hard because I'd never been away from, from England at all, you know. Were you getting, gaining confidence, though, as a singer? Because you, no. No, you weren't. No. Interesting. Uh, it's very, you know, people they go on about that thing. It's, to me, I think like things like self-esteem and g- gaining confidence, it's it's a, a funny thing, you know, when you still, uh, you have a few number one hits and you do all these big shows and yet you still think like, what's it, what, what, what's all the fuss about? You know, I, I always say to my, I tell my wife the story about like, Going to Manchester. Your wife, Ronnie, who's here, who we yeah. just met, who's lovely. You know, we, we go to, I, I go to Manchester on, on a train and I'm like, William Ashton. And at the time, there was a thing going on in England called the Profumo Trials, where these politicians oh, were. Oh, yeah, it's famous. Yeah, right, famous. And they had me throwing files and pushing filing cabinets over in the studio. And then I get the train back to Liverpool and I'm walking up the street and it's like, this crowd of kids at the top of the, top of the street, and I thought, what's that all about? Is there a fire or something? And it was kids who'd seen me on TV, and they were all, you know, I had to get a police escort and all that kind of stuff, and, like, everything changed. How strange. Just, you know, um, and, and I, I, was, I always felt like I was just a self-conscious, overweight kid, and it's like, what, what, you know, these girls didn't look at me three months ago. Right. That's all <laughs> three that's months all ago, I was working on trains. Yeah, three months ago, yeah. I was in Greece, up to my elbows in Greece. And, right. You know. So the girls are never a bad part of, rock, of the rock and roll life. No. no <laughs> <laughs> that seems to come up a lot with the musicians we've had on this I show. know. Everybody's like that. Yeah. yeah. So when did you meet Gene Vincent? Gene Vincent was appearing at the, the Star Club. Bebopalula. Bebopalula, yeah. Uh, and that's where I met him. Yeah. Died young. Yeah. Yeah. He, well, he, you know. What was he like? A rock and roller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he rock and rolled and he played hard, you know. But I got on very well with him and uh, it, it was, you know, we struck a friendship and we were good friends. You know, I saw him from time to time. Sure. And this is later, but one of Gilbert's favorites is Gene Pitney, another Gene. Yes. That you, befri- that you befriended. Yeah. Um, it's so, uh, it's so... It was um, one of my two early tours, and I'd seen, um, there used to be this TV show called Duke Box Jury, and if something was a hit, they rang a bell. If something was a flop, you know, they thought it was a flop, they'd smash the record. You know what I mean? Yeah, okay. So they, I remember distinctly the record Town Without Pity. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, I come to do this tour, and Gene Pitney's on it, and I'm talking to the guys who are in the band, and I go like, well, what's he like? And they go, well, he's a very good singer, Billy, but the kind of music that he does, I don't, <laughs> I don't think you know it, it's going to go down too well. Well, I'll tell you the truth. I had a hard job the whole tour because he was a tremendous performer, a great singer, you know. Um... I was lucky that I had uh, three number ones by at this time. Right. And, you know, I, it carried me. That's being honest. Yeah, sure. Because I wasn't the, you know, I mean, I got better over years. We all do. You only get worse, you know. That's the way I look at it. But but I was very inexperienced, and he was he was really good, you know. Did you bar- And, and did, uh, right. it's very important, just so the audience knows who he is, when you stop 
to gaze upon a star. People talk about how bad we are. How can anything survive? How can we keep love alive when these little minds tear us in two? No, it isn't very pretty. What a town without pity can do. <laughs> Billy didn't know what to do. He, he, he didn't know whether to join in or run. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for a voice, Bill? Um, should we sign, get him signed up somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> it's no worse than these rappers that I got. <laughs> There's a compliment, Gil. <laughs> you brought up the songs. Let's talk about the songs. Let's. What bad to me happened first? Yeah, no, it didn't. Oh, it didn't. Do you want to know a secret? Oh, well, I got my chronology wrong. Ah. Yes, yes. Um, that was the first record. And it was before the Beatles. How did that come to be? Brian Epstein gave it gave me a tape, uh, one of them Grundig tapes, and it was John Lennon. Funny enough, it wasn't. People always ask me about demos. I never received a demo, of all, uh, apart from "Do You Want Another Secret." It was just him on an acoustic guitar, and he said, "I apologize for the quality." But I did it in the quietest place I could find and flushed the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> he had that sense of humor. Yes. And, you know, all the other songs I have recorded, like Bed to Me, he came to the studio and sat at the piano and played me, actually. And he played me, I want to hold your hand. He said, I want to play you a song and please give me your opinion. And he played, I want to hold your hand. And I went, can I have that one? And he said, no, we are doing that. We're keeping that one. Yeah. <laughs> but John and Paul came to all the things that I recorded of this. Yeah, they really supported you. Yeah, I did. Yeah, um, I see a lot of people. I a big hit in England, but I'll keep you satisfied, which mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. one of their songs. Sure. Uh, I did. I call your name. Which is the, sure. I did that a year and a half before they did. Were they writing songs for you as a favor to Brian or because they liked you? I hope they liked me. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? Uh-huh. Um, and know. they were try- they were trying to be supportive of your career. I think that, you know, they were always supportive. I remember the f- one day I was rehearsing at the cabin, funny enough, and they came and sat in the front row and listened in and stuff like that. You know, when I was on tour with them on the road, they would always come to the side of the stage and... You know, uh, when Beatlemania was all crazy in England and I was touring with them, then they'd always come to the side of the stage and John would even say to me, you never did it tonight, Billy. Meaning what? If I hadn't really turned it on, and oh. he'd tell me. Yes. And interestingly, there's another thing in the book that earlier in your career, he said to you, he said something that stopped you. He said, where's the show? Yes, that's right. And what did that mean? Where's the show? It meant you're not doing it. You're not doing it. You're not turning it on, man. You know. So he was that honest with you. Absolutely. Yeah. And when you toured with them, and it's in the book too, you 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 were a prisoner in the hotels, kind of like they were. Yes. There was nowhere to go. Nowhere to go, no. And you couldn't get out. Why? Is what for your for your own safety? Well, in the, there was no security. You know, there'd be like the local p- policeman or something. You know. And there'd be these thousands of girls. It would be right around every theater we went to. You know, you came off stage and you had to battle your way through a crowd and get on a coach and go to the hotel. And it was like day in and day out. It was like that. 
I can see Gilbert's dying to ask you yes. the specifics about how the women were. Yeah. <laughs> well, you never got a chance, really. You know. No time. No time. Yeah. Oh, but- well, that makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Gil, that doesn't happen to you when you're in a hotel? Oh, yeah, the yeah, after I do ha-has in Cincinnati, it's non They're swarming. Non-stop pussy. You know, <laughs> you know it's, it's, you know, to me, it's it's very flattering. Yeah, sure. You know, but I mean, um, I don't know. I just, you know, I had the, I had girlfriends that I would see. But it was weird because, like, if I went to Liverpool, if I wanted to have a quiet drink, I'd have to go, like, a hundred mile away to some, you know, country pub or restaurant. That's how it was. You ever see a movie, an American movie, called uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand? Robert Zemeckis film? No. It's about the Beatles coming to New York and playing the Sullivan Show. Oh, yeah. It's fun. You should take a look at it. Oh, tell us about doing the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah, I, I'll tell you the truth. If I'd have known how many people actually watched that show, I'd, I don't. I think I'd have gone on the first plane home. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit nerve wracking to like look at a camera and think there's seventy million people looking at you. What song did you sing? I sang uh, all of them. I sang "Do You Want a Secret?" Mm-hmm. and "Bed to Me" and "From a Window." And, did you meet Sullivan? Did you have any experience of, of no, the man? No, he never said a lot to me. Yeah. No. It's, it was weird because we did the sound. It was it was strange because I remember we did the sound check in the afternoon and they turned the amplifiers the wrong way around. And I was like, what's this all about? It was obviously because it keeps the, the volume down, you know. And um, I went off and I just really made sure I knew exactly when I was going to be on when I came back. And I just went on and did it, you know. Mm-hmm. It's funny because I never saw any of them things because nobody, nobody had VCRs and things like that. And uh, not two years later, you saw them. So, I saw Tammy the, Show too. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Tell us who you were on the bill with on the Tammy Show. We we had Steve Binder here, as I mentioned to you. Oh before. yeah, I've got to tell you the Steve Binder. Yeah, you know Steve Binder. He, I don't know why, but I read this thing in in a, in a newspaper where he said uh, when they. Brought it out on DVD. Uh, I, my least of all favorite was Billy J. Kramer. So I was on a plane going to Santa Fe with with my wife, and I composed an email the whole trip. And <laughs> when we when we got to Santa Fe, I sent it to him, uh-huh. and I I more I said in the in the email I said you know. Why did you pick on me? You know, because um, Leslie Gore was poppy. The Beach Boys oh, were poppy. Yeah. Jerry and the Pacemakers were poppy. Why, why me? You know. So I sent this email off, and he came back to me on his hands and knees early. And um, he apologized. He apologized. Yes. So then um, he said, that, "You know, the next time in California, I'd love to meet up with you." So when when I went to California, we got together. That's nice. And um, he uh, it was very nice and asked me, he said, have you forgiven me? And I said, of course. He may never forgive us, Gilbert, Gilbert and I, but I'm glad he forgave you. Yeah. Oh, he's a good man. We, we, we he's enjo- a good man. We enjoyed I'm, having him. I'll be honest with you. If I had known that he did the Elvis comeback special, I, I would have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> Because <laughs> I thought that was so good. That's funny. As long as you bring up the Tammy show, I mean, tell us your experience of uh, the Stones trying to follow James Brown. Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. I mean, it was, it's impossible. Yeah. Because, you know, um, there was a lot of great artists on that show. An amazing bill. An amazing, you know, and... Chuck Berry, too. Chuck Berry, Marvin Gaye, the Beach Boys. Supremes. Supreme, yeah. Uh, all of them. It's the all-time bill. The all-time bill. And James Brown went on and was just at the top of his game. He was phenomenal. And it took about an hour and a half or two hours to shut the crowd up. And quite frankly, you know, I really felt, I felt sorry for the Stones because, I mean, it was like, <clears throat> what can I say? It was a bit pathetic after, you know... I've heard comics say that about following you, Gil. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's in, well, because you know, the audience is gone. After. <laughs> you know, everybody's had that experience. Right. You know, it's like people say to me, I had someone recently talking about, like, following the Beatles, and like, you know, did you ever follow? I went, yes, I did. <laughs> what was it like? There's, Terrible. <laughs> there's been a few of, like, well, Alan and Rossi. I think followed the Beatles. Oh, on Sullivan. Yeah, but this this was at a gig in London. A gig in London. And Brian Epstein says you're going to have to close on it. I went, why? He said they've got to go somewhere. I said, well, can't the Big Three do it? That was another band that he managed. He went, no, no, you've got to do it. It was hard work. There was no following them. No, it was hard. No. <laughs> yeah. It's like following God. Yeah. I hate I looked- to say that, but. Yeah. It's interesting where the stories in the book is how their 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 equipment would arrive late sometimes and they'd wind up playing the Dakota's instruments. Oh, yeah. That there's supposedly a p- picture of Ringo playing. There is a picture of Ringo yeah. playing uh, the Tony Bookbinder's drums. It's great. Yeah. So do you want to know a secret as a hit? Yes. And then what happens? Then what happens is I was in uh, on tour with the Beatles and John Lennon came up to me on my 20th birthday and said, I've got a song for you. He was reading the Melody Maker, and they just entered the charts in the United States. And um, I said, well, play it. And he said, no. I said, you know, it's my birthday today, John. And he said, well, I'll come to Abbey Road. And I didn't think he was going to show. But uh, when I was next to Abbey Road, he came and played the song Bad to Me. Wow. Now, this is a great picture in the book of your 20th birthday party. Yeah, that, was, every, in the, that was in the dress room at the theater. Everybody's there. Yeah. So he played bad to me, and you said, I'll take it. I thanked him very much. Yeah. Uh, you know. And another hit. If you leave me, I'll be so blue. Don't you ever leave me, I'm so in love with you. The birds in the sky would be sad and lonely If they knew that I must mind One and only they'd be sad You're bad to me The leaves and the trees would be softly sighing If they heard from the breeze that you let me cry And they'd be sad to be bad to me I remember the fit like Brian Epstein called me when Do You Want to Know the Secret was number one. And I was like, where do I go from here? And then Bad to Me, like, like the same thing. You know. Yeah. And then the third one was I'll Keep You Satisfied. And that got to number three. Pretty thought, good. And I thought, that's not good enough. And then I stepped away from Lennon McCartney and did Little Children, which was number one. Right. Right. I mean, you tr- it's interesting because you trusted your instincts on that one and oh, you were proven right. Yes. Yeah. You're not always right. You're not always right. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> you were turning their songs down at that point. Yeah, you were you saying know, thank it, you, but no thank you. Well, the, the three songs that they offered me at the time were done by other people and went successful. I see. I mean, I never asked. The only time I ever asked for a song was uh, um, Beatles were doing a show at a, a, a theater called the ABC in Blackpool, and Paul played Yesterday to me. And I went, no, I want a rock and roll song. Because in England, not here, but I just had a hit with the Bert Bacharach song, Trains, Boats, and Planes. I love that one. Um, I love your version of it. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, and I um, wanted to do, I've just, actually, I've just recorded yesterday just to show people that I could do it. Because <laughs> <laughs> you turned it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you kicked yourself at all? <laughs> No, uh, no, you win some, lose some. That's the oh, way yeah. it goes. He was looking for a, a rocker yeah. at I, the time. Yeah. Well, I'm, you're like 22 years of age, and I thought that's a bit, you know. Right. Ah. Okay, so now Little Children goes to number one. Right. So now you've had three number ones, and things are cooking. Yeah. And I, I went back to Lennon McCartney, and I did uh, From a Window. Love that one, too. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this, is fun. this is a fun thing. What did you do with your first royalty check for EMI? I went out and I bought a load of records. I <laughs> love that. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And then after Little Children, this is this is kind of a turning point in your life. Yes. This is around the time. Do I have the chronology right now? Or this is, when, when does Brian? 
when well, the Iron Pass. I'd, I'd had from a window. Right. Which got to number 12. Right. And, you know, it's, it's a long story about the little children thing was, was like, it was, um, I was so, sort of like disappointed because like, I'll keep you satisfied was number three. And I really thought, you know, it was going to be number one. Mm-hmm. And I did the London Palladium, which I didn't want to do. And I wasn't very good and it was a disaster. <laughs> the record sales fell away and I thought, that, it's all over, you know. You always thought it was going to end. I thought this is all over, and and then I just really went around publishers, and uh, I had thousands of acetates, and um, I didn't know how to tell him. You know, uh, Brian, I've got this song, and I think it's better than this. You know, and I didn't tell him, but eventually he did find out, and it made things a bit cold between us for a while. Yeah, you say in the book things changed after that. Things changed after that. And then he came to see me at the Shakespeare Theatre in Liverpool and said, you know, let's work on a new project when I come back from the States. And I said, fine, you know. And unfortunately, he died. And it was a very, very hard period for me, you know. Um, I bet it was shocking. It, I, As a I, young man. I just didn't know what to do, you know. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know, where do I go? And he was in the process of um, forming his own label. And I did a couple of things for that. You know, I did a, a Bee Gees song, um, Town of Tuxley Toy Maker Part 1. Right. And then I did Harry Nielsen's 1941, but I didn't have the power of EMI behind me. Picking good songwriters, though. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to. Yeah. Know. And, uh, you know, I, but I kept working. You know, I kept working in England. His brother uh, was, was, was going to take over and try to manage for a while? He was, was going to take over, and, and I just didn't think it was, you know... It, to me, I'm I'm weird in this way that I, like... <laughs> they'd taken a lot, on a lot of people that went from Liverpool. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, I don't want to be with that, that office, you know. Interesting. And I, I decided to go elsewhere. Yeah. So, so his death kind of threw you for a, a loop. Well, I always, I say, I knew nothing about show business. I was really protected. Yeah, you know, everywhere I went, like once a week, I would get a registered letter with checks for the band, checks for the road crew, so much of a float. There'd be a complete breakdown of everything, and I, you know, um, he really took care. You know, and um, suddenly I was open to all the piranhas. Interesting. Yeah. I think the Beatles were a little lost at that moment, too. I would say so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You'd lost a friend, too, in addition to losing a manager. Don't want to to lose sight of that Um, with Brian. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. He was always there at birthdays, you know. Um, always cards at Christmas. Very thoughtful, you know. He would, when I was starting, for instance, he would uh, come to shows unannounced, and um, he'd come backstage afterwards and he'd go through the set list, you know, and what you'd said and how you'd announce songs, and what songs you'd sang and get rid of that one, and he'd get the the crew and say the lighting, you know, he'd go over everything and. Um, um, yeah, there's a line in the book that's touching. You say he took you from the railway to uh, the top of the pops. Yes, it's a big, right. quite a journey. Well, I, I always say that I didn't know what knife and fork to use until I met Brian. That's a wonderful line. But um, you know, um, you toured with the New Dakotas for yeah. a bit. Yeah, and uh, I also want to ask you about this. Um, there's a when the Beatles uh, split up. There's a there's a quote in the book. Um, you say you were shocked by how it went down, but you also understood it. You understood the pressure. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could, that, that, something like that can only go on for so long. You know. I mean, I thought I was under a lot of pressure, but in comparison with what they were going through, you know, and it's inevitable because let's face it. You know, there were four very young guys. And eventually, you know, they they get older and they have minds of their own and 
tastes of their own. Of course. And, and what they want from life and things like that, you know. And, um, you know, funny enough, I, with me, I just thought, I'll be really, really honest with you. I, I saw them um, getting on the train with the Maharishi, and I thought, I'd better find a new direction. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, the, yeah. like the Beatles themselves realized that after a while. Yeah, I realized it right away, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about John. I mean, you get the sense from the book, your book in particular, but other things that I've read, that, that he, he could be a handful. Um, not with me. No, but you didn't, you took a, a liking to Cynthia and you weren't wild about uh, some I, I, of the things that went down. Is that fair to say? I, I, you know, I, I mean, he would always say to me at different things, you know, when they, when they brought an album out and they'd have a, a big splurge somewhere, he said, we'd keep an eye on Cynthia and I would sit with her and dine and dance and talk and we became very good friends and I liked her very much. And I'll be honest with you, I mean, I was shocked when he uh, went off with Yoko Ono. Um, I can understand it now in later years, you know, but it made me kind of back off, you know. And people would say to me, why don't you go and see John? And I was like, you know, and I'm, I was, I've always been sorry that I never re, reconnected, you know. Um... You worded very sweetly in the book, and you said that uh, when he died, it felt like the sun went out and traffic stopped. That's right. Which is really painting a picture. Um, that's you know, really uh, that's uh, that's how how it felt. You know, it, it's like I, I remember being like in the middle of London that day, and that's exactly how it felt. You know, and a lot of people have strong opinions about Yoko Ono. What was your opinion? I can't really give an opinion because believe it or not I've never met her oh you never met Yoko I never met Yoko yeah. and so I, I can't form an opinion sure obviously it was the love of his life and that's that's the way it is you know um, what can I say you know were there opportunities to, to, to reconnect with John that you didn't take yeah you know I was over here on tour and people would give me his card and I just never bothered yeah you know? Well, how could you know? Well, you know, it you know, go. it's just, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I really wished I would have done. I think, you know, you know, going through a divorce myself afterwards, you know, I also could see it in a different way. Gilbert brought up George Martin, too, and, and uh, get, you get the sense from the book that you had your struggles. You had your conflicts. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, he wasn't in love with your voice at first. Uh, well, you know, John Lennon was, so that's more important. That there you go. <laughs> um, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, I was very intimidated by George. Uh -huh. And me meeting George Martin to me was like meeting the Duke of Edinburgh. That's intimidating. Uh, yeah, it's in intimidating, and I didn't think he was very warm. And I was a very shy, you know, mm -hmm. kid, but... Um, you know, like, for, like you know, I hear all these wonderful stories, and he did wonderful with the Beatles. But I mean, things like bed to me. You know, I spent a whole day of like converting him, saying it's the wrong key, George. You know, we started off in the morning recording bed to me in E, and I said no, it's too it's too high. We should do it in D. It sounds shouted in E, and he poo pooed me. So he gave in in the end and. When we change the key, it works, you know. And um, I don't know, you know, um, I never warmed to George, and George never warmed to me, and that's just one of those things, you know. But you produced some good stuff together, in spite of that. I, I, well, yeah, I think a lot of, the, you know, to me, a lot of it, uh, I give Norman Smith a lot of credit. Norman Smith. The engineer. Normal. Yes, he, no, he was normal, and he played in the band. Yeah. And he knew what went on, you know. And he used to say to me when I was like shaking a bit and a bit nervous, just tell him, tell him you don't like it. Right. What is the thing you talked about? The, the musicians uh, will love this. Our friend John Fotiatis is here, who's obsessed with this kind of stuff, and also Bill Porcelli, who's here. Uh, he he would speed up or slow down 
tracks. You were, you you specifically were talking about uh, a drum solo, not a good, not a drum solo. Excuse me, a guitar solo. He would even on on Little Children, like he would slow slow the track to half speed and play the, the the piano part in a low register, and when it was sped up again, it gave that wound up piano sound. Uh-huh. You know, I I think he used it on like the guitar solo in Hard Day's Night and things what, like. What did he do? He slowed the track down, and George played the the solo at half speed. Uh, on a six string and a twelve string and the piano as well, and the, the whole lot together sounds pretty nice. That's fascinating to me. Yeah, and he worked. And he, and he produced comedy records too, which people forget. Yeah, he worked well, with the Goons. He worked with the Goons. Yeah. He worked with Shirley Bassey. Yes, he worked with Matt Monroe. You know, um, worked with a lot of people. I think of Bond themes when you say Shirley Bassey and Matt Monroe <laughs> <laughs> from Russia with Love. Isn't yes. that what comes to? Yeah. Isn't that what comes to mind? Yeah. Um. So so Brian's gone, and uh, and you're recording. At what point do you do the the Neil Diamond song? Um, you couldn't get anybody interested in Sweet Caroline, which I find hilarious. Yeah, because you know Neil Diamond had not done anything, sure. He had not done anything in England, and nobody was interested. And I just liked the song, and I just thought I'm going to do it to hell with it. At that time, I was just doing my own records independently. Yeah. Couldn't get anybody to no, to take a bite. I'll be honest with you. It was like it was a, it was a, like if you were a sixties artist, it'd be like I felt like a leper. Really? How so? I thought the engineers at the BBC and people like that were very cynical towards Northerners anyway. You know, right from the beginning. Yeah. You know, what are you going to do when this is all over? <laughs> remarks, remarks like that, and you know. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> you, also, you also, I found it interesting too. I guess I should have known this, but early in the book, you say that Londoners had an attitude to, oh, toward Liverpool, Lee, and so. Well, you know, I, I don't know why it, it must. It, it goes back a long time. Uh-huh. But you know, it, it's like I, I noticed, like when I spent a week in London, first time on my own, and it's like you're a nice guy. Where are you from, Liverpool? And it's like as if people jump back three feet. You know. Uh, I think people f- from the south thought that we were rough-edged and sure. uncouth, and you know didn't have the greatest reputation. Um, I, I thought, think that's true here with Manhattan and the boroughs, don't no, you think, Gil? Oh yeah, it's the I, same kind of. Yeah, but you know, I think the you know it was a superiority. I, I you know it, it's very fun, funny because um, you know a friend of mine came to see me um, do a performance in, in Liverpool about four years ago. And he was coming through the immigration, and, and the guy said to him, like, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Louisville to see a friend of mine performing at the cavern. And he went, what on earth are you going there for? And this is like 50 years later. So. <laughs> 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 yeah. When did you decide to tour Africa, which is another interesting uh, journey for you? Well, for me, I'll be honest with you, I, it was like I worked with this band called Late, who were very good. And I really enjoyed working with them. They had an opportunity to go off and make a, an album for Atlantic. And um, I got this offer to go on tour Africa. And I'll be honest with you, you know, I, I thought to myself, you know, I've been in this business quite a while. And, you know, it's about time I bought a home. You know, I was making all this money and spending it on all sorts of stupid things. Uh, More records? More records. <laughs> no, by this time it was like making records, which is very expensive. Oh, right, sure. You know, and, and I just thought it'd be a good thing to do, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. You played South Africa too. I played South Africa, and I played at Soweto, and you know, I always, I, just, I, I know what it's like to be black. When I played Soweto, it was me and a couple of musicians. And there were just all black people, and I got the vibe. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and there's a, there's kind of a horror story attached to you, your the money. Yes. Yeah. I got I got I got ripped off, uh, which you know I mean, do you want me to tell the whole story? Well, that's a, yeah, tell a shortened version of it because it's interesting. It's very interesting. Well, at the end of the tour, I went over the accounts with the the agents, and gave me a check for the balance of, and I took it into the bank, and. The guy said, the bank manager would like to see you. And I said, uh, my phone said, well, you cannot leave the country. He said, we can cash your check, but if you leave the country and it's cash, they can take it off you and that's it. 
So I said, what's the procedure? He said, well, you find a lawyer and you put it in bond and when you, he gets permission for you, it's forwarded to your account, which is what I did. But the lawyer ran off with the Absconded money. Absconded with the money. Uh, yeah, and that Unbelievable. was Unbelievable. And I didn't get my house and I didn't get any. You believe that, Gil? Wow. <laughs> That's rock and roll. Oh. <laughs> rock and roll. Is that what you said at the time? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I was very upset. <laughs> you know. When did you, well, why did you decide to, to move to the States? Um, you're here now. You're a New Yorker like us. Yes. I, I, I met my wife. Yes. And felt that she had a different slant on life and like nobody else had ever met. That's nice. And decided that I wanted to spend my life with her. It was kismet. It was kismet, yes. That's nice. You hear that, Ronnie? She's smiling out there? And she should say, I'm not the easiest guy to live with. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Dara could have a, could, uh, <laughs> maybe they could have a heart to heart. Yeah. Uh, you were also instrumental in getting Brian uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yes. Uh, well, you know, I uh, have this house in Santa Fe, which to me is, uh, you know, one of the most inspirational places I've ever ever been to and um, I just came home one day and said to her I'm going to buy a new guitar and she said well you haven't played one I bought you one 25 years ago and she sat there and I said well I hate to tell you but it was a piece of junk and I went out and bought a guitar and wrote this song to Liverpool with love love it and Sunsets to Santa Fe and, and I did the whole CD and I won the fight that was it Tell us, uh, you know, what you, you you toured with the CD. You you went out to promote the CD. I went out. I I did two British Invasion tours. Mm -hmm. with, yeah. And who was on those tours? Jerry Jerry Morris. No, he wasn't. Oh. Jerry wasn't. Uh, okay. Mike Penner from the Searchers. Oh, okay. Denny Lane, Peter Asher. Oh, yeah. All great artists. And then I went to England, and I to uh, support the record. Yeah, and I did like forty four concerts. And wow. 50 days. Did you guys, did the Dakotas turn down needles and pins? Well, you know, it's, it's you know. You remember that one, Gil? Oh, It was God. very. Needles and pins. Uh, pins oh, uh, yes, <laughs> yes. You know, because, why why you know, do I think Sonny Bono wrote that song? You know, it, it, people ask me about it, because, and that was one of the frustrating things with the Dakotas. I mean, I would go to them with the song, and then they go, we're not playing it. It just didn't. Uh, you know, and I was like, in New York, and I met Jack Nitzi, who did the arrangements for the Spectre records, and he gave me When You Walk in the Room and Needles and Pins. Uh -huh. And I, I, at the time, I had a record player in my car that played 45s. And I went, I'm, I'm home a while, and I'm playing these songs. I thought, these are hit songs. And when I played them to the band, they were like, you know. They just didn't. They, they didn't. I'll, I'll be honest with you, I always say that... Uh, it's a long time ago. There's no hangups, but you know, it was a bad move. Yeah, it was a bad move. Big hit, Needles yeah, and Pins. A, yeah, big hit. But I mean, it was a bad move working with them. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh, I see. In the broader sense, do I have that right? Is Porcelli out there? Did Son didn't Sonny Bono write Needles and Pins when he was working for Spectre? Jackie e. Shannon, I think. Oh well, I'm getting a thumbs up from the research team. All right, we'll we'll throw it out there. Yeah, they should have listened to you, Bill. I know. Uh, but I'm not right all the time. None of us are. Do you guys, uh, you you guys want to take it? Would you dare do something as bold and as crazy as singing something with Gilbert? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if he wants to. Yeah. 
<laughs> you got a guitar. <laughs> that was a reaction. Can you get a guitar <laughs> off? You know, but we do have something. Uh, we do have a kind of a karaoke version. Of what? It's Do You Want to Know a Secret? Which, okay. which, which uh, I hope I can should, still sing it. You should have. <laughs> I apologize for the karaoke track. That's all right. But this should, this should, uh, we should do some damage here. <laughs> Yo, there definitely will be damage. You are about to sing with a uh, a British invasion icon, my friend. <laughs> I hope. Well, just say when. Uh, Frankie? You never know how much I really love you. You never know how much I really care. Now listen. Do you want to know a secret? Good, I do. Do you promise not to tell? Wow. Closer. Good, I do. Let me whisper in your ear. Good, I do. Say the words you like to hear. I'm, I'm in love, love with you. With you. Woo. <laughs> Closer. <laughs> Let me whisper in your ear. That's your part. <laughs> oh, wow. I know this. Oh, wait. Here. I know the secret for a week. Oh, he's like, wait. It's wait. His part. Oh, yo, God. Sorry. <laughs> Listen, secret for a week or two. Nobody knows. Just we two. Listen. Secret, do I do? Do you promise not to tell? Whoa, closer, do I do? Let me whisper in your ear, <laughs> do I do? Say the words you love to hear. I'm in love with you. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Bill, you're a trooper. <laughs> well, thank you. That was great. Should we do it again? <laughs> Gil, was that one of the thrills of your career? Oh, yeah. I, that was... <laughs> That's so great. Well, oh. well that, that made my night. The book is called... <laughs> Do you want to know a secret? Do you want to know a secret? And the CD is called I Won the Fight. Right. And where can people get the book and where can people get the uh, CD? Um, it's on Amazon. Okay. Both of them. Yeah. And when are you going to be playing these parts? Anytime in the near future? Um, I have nothing planned at the moment. Okay. I'm, I'm going out to LA later this week. You won't tour with Gilbert? No. Oh, I'd love to. That'd be great. <laughs> that would be fabulous. <laughs> yeah. You know, he sang with some heavy hitters on this I'm show. I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> Paul yeah. Williams. Oh, that's right. Uh, Mar- Tony Orlando. Tony Orlando. Mark Hudson. Dick Van Dyke. Dick Van Dyke. Who recently? Did I forget somebody? Uh, Frankie? Who else did he sing with? I think he got them all. Did I get them all? No, there's more than Unless that. Unless you want to do an actual duet with me. That would, be, that would be a great thing. What's that? We should do a duo. We should do a record together. Because <laughs> I didn't let you jump in on Town Without Pity. You, you want to do a little Gene Pitney? No, um, no, no. <laughs> He's had enough. <laughs> no, not Gene Pitney. It all depends which song. Uh, which one? Which one do you like? Uh, I like. I'm going to be strong. You know that one, Gil? No. <laughs> okay. Twenty four hours from Tulsa, Gil. Twenty four no. hours from Tulsa. You must know. That was a hit. Hello, I'm, Mary I'm, Lou. He wrote. Hello, Mary Lou. I believe Rick Nelson. <laughs> a little fast, isn't it? No, it's great. Okay. Hello, Hello Mary, Mary Lou. Lou. Goodbye, heart. Sweet Mary Lou, I'm so oh, in love with, with you. you. <laughs> I knew no. Mary Lou. No. We never Have part. So hello. Goodbye, heart. <laughs> Pass me by one sunny one day. day. Pass those big brown eyes my way. I knew I wanted you forevermore. Well, I 
I'm that one that gets around She looks to me to the ground And so I sure look to you today Okay, I good. Hello, hello, Mary Lou <laughs> Goodbye, hi Hello, oh, man. Mary Lou And goodbye, hi Close <laughs> I knew Mary Lou We, we never, never part, part. So hello, hello, Mary Lou, Lou. <laughs> oh, that was fantastic. <laughs> wow. You should do an album. You yes. guys got you guys got to do an LP. <laughs> it's official. <laughs> Bill, we can't thank you enough oh, for coming pleasure. here and entertaining us and telling us your life story. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. You have seen it all. I've seen it all. I've enjoyed it, and thank you very much. Of course, my friend. Okay. Gil. I'm Gilbert <laughs> Gottfried. This has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and the man who has just been... Uh, holding back my musical career <laughs> all these years. You could bless him without him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> He's just been dead weight around my head. <laughs> Billy J. Kramer. <laughs> Billy, this was a, a real thrill for us. Thanks, Thank buddy. You. Thanks. My pleasure. And I live my life for you. Just to have a love like that Oh, I would be true And I'd live my life for you So, meet me tonight Just where the light shines From a window And as I take your hand Say that you Be my true love